Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the Big East Rewind. I'm Chuck Everson, your seven-foot host from Villanova University, and my <coughs> partner, as always, the sensational Sonny Sparrow. How are you, Sonny? Chuck, I'm great. We've been uh, we've been talking about this one, and it's great that it's actually come to fruition, and we got some just high-level, top-notch people. I can't wait. Oh, this is cool because yeah, we 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 try to put shows together that are interesting and uh, and are different and you know that kind of thing. And when we get a cluster of people that are have one thing in common like this, uh, it's always fun to hear everybody's opinion and what happened and putting all yeah. the pieces together and hearing all the stories. So uh, that's the one thing that uh, I think is really really good about this. And so. I'm going to start with like this, Sonny. When you think of some of the best high school teams ever to play in our era, okay, who do you think of? What are some of the teams that come to mind for you? Well, you, you know, you got St. Anthony's, Jersey City. You got DeMatha. Yep. yep. Probably Oak Hill Academy. Um, IMG, right? IMG, yeah. Well, listen, you're missing the biggest one of all, and that's the team that's – going to be here with us today we got the we got a couple of the players and the coach the Dunbar poets are in the house okay so you know and it's funny because you, when you hear that name Sonny the poets it doesn't put fear into anybody's heart hearing a team called the poets come out to play we're playing yeah, you, you think they'd come out and beat you with their books you know what I mean How, however however they will uh they will get after it and get, they went no. undefeated for two and a half years or three years I, they, they will get you there's no doubt about it don't yeah. let the name fool you don't let the cover fool you you know these guys were excellent they had four nba players come off this team and 11 d1 kids uh come off this team so say that again say that again ado, 11 11 one players geez we're gonna find out all about it for sure we had a so, couple of them come with us at syracuse but that's another story go ahead so our first guest today is our old friend, a pal of the show, uh, a 1984 national champion with the Georgetown Hoyas, 10-year NBA pro, Hoya legend, the great Reggie <coughs> Williams. How are you, Reg? I'm doing pretty good, Chuck. How are you? I'm good, good you, man. Reg. Always, always good to catch up with you, buddy, and I appreciate you putting this all together for us. You, Reggie was the linchpin in putting this all together for us, Sonny, so this yep. is going to be great. So. Our next guest is a 15-year NBA pro. He was the number 12 pick in the 87 draft. Um, spent most of his time with the Charlotte Hornets, but he was drafted by the Washington Bullets. And in my estimation, Sonny, he was the absolute star of Space Jam. Other than Michael Jordan, he was the star of the movie to me. The great Muggsy Bogues. How are you, Muggsy? Hey, I'm good, guys. Hey, Appreciate you having me on. Hey, and before I introduce Coach, Sonny, I got to tell you something. And tell me if I'm wrong, Muggs, okay? Because we do our due diligence here. This is not we just turn the videos on, everybody starts talking, that's a show. We actually look things up. Did you initially go to school because you wanted to be a dental technician? Absolutely. Yeah, I wanted to well, be there a you dental go. technician. It's, too... now, you know, you... <laughs> it's 30 years too you late. To. Sonny, you Sonny, if you want to go to Dumbo, you have to go to I could have hooked you up. Sonny's a dentist. How about that? And of course, we wouldn't be able to talk about this great team without the great leader of this team. Uh, the Dunbar High School coach from Morgan State University played football there. He also played in the NFL, Sonny, for the Steelers and the Washington Redskins, the hometown Washington Redskins. And he played for Vince Lombardi, you know. With a record, a 10-year record at Dunbar of 341 wins and 25 losses, the great head coach, Bob Wade. Thanks, Coach, for coming in. We appreciate having you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. So, Coach, I got to ask you before we get started. You know, you played for Vince Lombardi. Tell, talk about, tell us what that was like. That had to be, that guy is one of the greatest coaches, they say, in any sport of all time, he gets recognized as one of those guys. How was that playing for him? Well, it, first of all, it was a very rewarding experience. He was a no-nonsense coach. Uh, you know, he believed in you do your job, come to practice, do what you're supposed to do, mm -hmm. give your best in each, each and every game. But more importantly, he believed in 
He believed in family first, um, your religion and family, and of course, uh, your profession. But he was a no-nonsense uh, uh, coach. Uh, in my opinion, he was an excellent coach. Yeah. I mean, he's he's noted for that. That's that's unbelievable. That's uh, that's something to say that you actually played for the guy. That's that's awesome. So let's get this started, fellas. Let's start with you guys, Reggie and, uh, and Muggs. Talk about, I guess, Muggs, you first. Talk about what it was like growing up in Baltimore at the Lafayette Court uh, housing projects and, and what that was like and what, what the times were like back then when you guys were getting ready to go to school at uh, Dunbar. Oh, well, you was, well, as a kid growing up in the inner city, I was saying that, you know, as a, any kid, you were just interested, just want to be outside, you know, interested in any, uh, any type of hobbies that was outdoors, football, basketball, and that sort of thing, you know. But Reg and I, we grew up in the welfare project. Uh, we was blessed to be tutored by a man by Mr. Leon Howard, who gave us our vision in terms of what it was a uh, means of learning how to get in basketball and being able to take that understand and apply it to each and every you know, level that we were able to get to and be successful. And fortunate enough for us, when we got to Dunbar, you know, we were just, you know, ready for that next level, that next step. And we were just fortunate that we had so many guys in it. Nothing like the IMG, as Sonny was alluding to, the, you know, the those type of schools that recruited players. You know, we all lived in the neighborhood and we just all you know, had history with that school. We don't want to go to the same school. Yeah, but and and more than that, like the neighborhood was tough where you guys were. I mean, you know, I mean, I saw the I saw the, uh, the documentary and I I did uh, looking up some stuff and and trying to get some a, a feel for what you guys had to go through. I mean, you actually got shot as a five year old kid being in the wrong place at the wrong time with with what's going on in the neighborhood, right? Well, the neighborhood was challenging. You know, that was an environment where any type of, you know, big cities that have to offer. Um, right. You know, like the kids, as we were saying, we were just wanted to be curious. We wanted to be outdoors. Um, we just had uh, a neighborhood that was drug infested. You know, guys was more or less interested in, you know, trying to make a living at the time. And, for, and unfortunately for me as a kid, as you alluded to, at the age of five years old, being at the wrong place at the wrong time, you know, I got shot. And uh, fortunate enough, the bullets missed me, but the buckshot sat all over my body. And that kind of, you know, uh, it changed my mindset from that moment on. And, uh, you, know, as, you know, as kids grew up, you know, we didn't have, you know, any means of living beyond 20 years old. You know, we just couldn't see beyond that. But again, basketball, you can understand it. There's more out there. We can do a lot more, than, you know, for our families to change their idea of it. What what about you, Reg? How did you uh, how did you get to meet and uh, and become such good friends with Muggsy? Well, um, we um, met in Lafayette Projects at the um, the Lafayette Recreation Center, and um, we just hit it off from that day. I mean, we I think we were maybe around ten, maybe Muggs around ten or uh, uh, nine or ten years old. You're a, little, you're a little younger than that. Yeah, no, we, we um we were yeah, mm -hmm. wrestling team. We were just flag football, whatever. You know, we played pool and then mugs and uh we are you know were competitive, and we used to play uh, ping pong against each other. So he he win, I win. So we you know we played ping pong, um you know and uh you know have fun that way. But um we um hit it off from from the jump, and um you know best friends you know for life. But, and all through like the AAU circuits and stuff like that, like uh, you know whatever you guys played CYO or whatever you guys played at the time when you were a kid, right? I mean, you guys were teammates for a long time. Yeah, we didn't. Um, they we didn't participate in the AAU. I didn't even know anything about AAU. Right. Um, we played um uh, summer basketball, BNBL, Baltimore B Basketball Neighborhood League, uh, uh, Project Survival leagues like that, <laughs> and um. We played on the same teams uh, with them, those leagues, um, for right. a lot of projects. So we always, um, you know, was on, you know, if it was 10, 12, 12, 14, or whatever. And um, that's how we, um, you know, started um, to play um, with each with with each other. So, coach, you you grew up, you were in the same kind of neighborhood, right? You grew up in Baltimore as well, didn't you? Yes. 
I grew up in Baltimore. I grew up uh, about a block and a half from the from the world renowned Johns Hopkins Hospital. Oh wow! Okay. And uh, of course, Dunbar High School is located in the fourteen hundred block of, of Orlean Street. Yeah, but I grew up uh, in that neighborhood. Um, my father, you know, I'm from a single single parent home. My uh, my father deserted my mom when I was four. And my sister was five, so my mother raised both of us. Wow. But uh, yeah, I'm from the neighborhood, so to speak. So what was it like to be from the neighborhood, have the success that you had in your professional career, then come back to the neighborhood and coach in the neighborhood? Okay. Well, I, I could relate to uh, to what the youngsters were going through because, you know, I went through the same, uh, I traveled the same road. Um, I hung out in the recreation center, not Lafayette, but I hung out in uh, what, a recreation center called uh, 101, which is uh, a few blocks away. Um, but I traveled the same road. Um, my mom worked, and I had to try to stay busy until my mom came home uh, to fix dinner. So I participated in a lot of uh, activities after school, you know, uh, basketball. Uh, football, baseball. I was a three three sport uh, participant. So um, when I when when I was fortunate enough to to get mugs and regiment in our program, uh, I I could relate to them because I I traveled the same road. So Muggsy, Reggie, who are some of the other guys that, that were key players for you in that program? Well, the key key players, I I, I speak first. Um, um, we had a lot of players uh, came up, grew up together, played. Uh, you know, um, you know, the early years. Um, we had several players that we played with. Um, that was before us, and with us. Um, I mean, there's a Dunbar has a rich history in basketball from the '50s or early. Mr. Wade can speak to that. Um, because he was, you know, yeah. Grew up during that time, but um, but Dunbar always um excelled at, in basketball and sports, you know. So um, I even have an uncle who um was very good um at Dunbar during the time that Mr. Wade was there. So we um you know played uh Skip Wise was a legendary player, Ernie Graham, um Calvin Maddox. I mean I can go down the line um with players Barry Scott, a lot of players who um that was before us that lived in the neighborhood. Um, that um, was like our our mentors, you know. So me and Muggs come along uh, during a time where you know, like Baltimore was open up, you know, it was open up for us to go out and do some things. You know, back then they, you know, they didn't really, you know, come to Baltimore to recruit players. Um, I but can't, when, yeah. When men, you know, Muggs and I came along, it was more, it was more open, and, and Coach Wade um, played a big part in that also. But you had like David Wingate, Reggie Lewis, you know, Herm, Mike Brown. I mean, you had players all from the neighborhood. So was it, Coach, I ask you this, was it also other schools are trying to bring these kids out, like to recruit them? Or did you have that, hey, stay here, you grew up here, stay here, we got this? How'd that work out? No, no, I was very fortunate. Uh, I coached their, their siblings. Uh, Muggsy's <laughs> sister, Sharon, was an outstanding player on the on the girls' basketball program. And his brother, uh, we called him Stro, but uh, his his brother was a running back on my football team like when I coached football. Um, and he had, you know, they had, had siblings uh, like Reggie alluded to. Calvin Kennan was Reggie's uncle. He was a tremendous basketball player. Back in the in the early '60s, uh, so I had a relationship with their with their siblings, with their mothers and fathers. Uh, so a lot of them wanted to continue the family legacy and and, and participate at Dunbar. So so what was it like putting those teams together? Like you you had a vision. I'm assuming you had a vision. Given given the the background, the players, the connection, did you ever envision it to become what it became? 
No, I did not. Uh, I think well, we lost to uh, we lost a triple overtime game to to Calvert Hall. It was one of the one of the, one of the uh, the talked about uh, basketball games in, in in Dunbar's history. Uh, we lost that game because uh, Muggsy was Muggsy did not play in that game, and uh, but after Muggsy came into the program. It, and then we, we, we moved Reggie. Reggie had to be had to handle the ball a lot for us uh, during his junior uh, his sophomore year. And uh, once Muggsy came into the program, and we were able to, to move Reggie and give him more freedom. Uh, and of course, you know, then Wingate came and to Reggie Lewis and, and so forth. Then we began we, we began to gel. And uh, I knew we had something special then, but I didn't know it would take us that far. But as the season progressed, and we we began to play uh, stiffer competition, going up to Camden, beating Camden in their their gymnasium where they had not lost a ball game in years in their gym. Uh, after that game, I I just knew we really had something special. So when I want to get back to that Camden game first, so was that when they had? Uh, um... Uh, Billy Thompson, Billy and, Thompson and those guys, yeah, yeah. and Dwayne and, uh, and and Milt Milt Wagner. They had um, Billy Thompson. Milt had um, went on to uh, Louisville. The Louisville, and, right? Okay. Point guard, a freshman mm -hmm. point guard or a sophomore point guard, Kevin Wall. Yeah, they yeah, yeah, they were good. Kevin Wall. Yeah, so um, you know, we had went up there. We yeah. heard them, and um, they had six nine, six ten guys, and uh. You know, we remember it quite well because when we went there, you know, we come out and um, people started to laugh at Muggsy's height. But we knew yeah. he had the biggest heart in the world. And we said, um, you know, once the game start, they they laughing now, but they're going to they gonna be crying later. Yeah. That's all right. 100%. That's what, that's what it was. And, um, you know, it ain't – Muggs didn't have a, you know, motivation – was already there. Motivation was already there. So um, yeah. that put, that put, you know, put a stamp on that. So Reg, let me ask you when, when Dave Wingate and Reggie Lewis came in, they were from another place. They were from uh, Cecil Kirk, right? Yes. Uh -huh. so did that, did you and Muggs, did you and Muggs, was there like a thing between the, the four of you guys at the beginning when they first came on that this is kind of your team and, that kind of thing, or was it? Did you guys gel right away, or how did and how did coach like kind of put that together? Because those are four big personalities, you know, on the basketball court. You know, there's only one ball, but you guys did a great job eventually of getting through whatever it was and and playing really really good basketball. Well, it wasn't my team, Muggsy team. It was Coach Wade's team. <laughs> there, oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, uh, you know, I was there. I was there first. Uh, Muggsy supposed to had came with me, but he he had um uh went to the zone zone school Southern. Yeah. So um you know he missed our sophomore year, um and so David and them came in I guess the year Muggsy came in um as as a junior. So um but it wasn't no problems. Um you know just like I said it was Coach Wade team. He 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 was the he was the man. You know what I mean so we respected that and um you know and um played to what, you know, he, he sent us out there to do. How, how did you manage that when you had two guys coming from one place that were friends and Reggie and Muggsy and another two guys coming in that were best friends in Dave Wingate and Reggie Lewis? Was there anything that you had to do to kind of make everybody so that they can all play together? Well, you left out one. one. You left out Timmy Dawson. Right. right. Okay. No, we you left, you, you left out a guy. You left out Tim Timmy Dawson. He yeah. He was he was from out of the area. But no, I I uh, I didn't have a problem because, uh, like Reggie said, you know, I wanted things done in a certain in a certain way, and uh, and we would go over and over the things I wanted done, and it and it uh, it became innate within their within their with their minds, you know, how we wanted things done or how I wanted things done. Uh, what type of uh, 
offensive set we were going to do different things defensively but they all they all blended in they all blended in it was not uh, uh i don't like him because uh he's from lafayette projects and i'm from up what we call up on the hill uh, i'm from cecil kirk you know once right. they step in the gymnasium we didn't have that problem that's good so let's talk about practices coach yeah let's talk you know, about reggie, the bricks let's talk oh yeah about that's what i'm bricks. getting to because reggie talks very fondly to us uh, you know in private about the bricks how much he loved working out with the bricks talk about that and how that all got started that's that question is mine that's my question yes yeah. yes sir <laughs> Well, Dunbar was not blessed with fancy weight equipment. We didn't have a universal gym uh, machine. Um, so they were doing a lot of uh, re uh, renovating in the neighborhood. They were tearing down a lot of the, 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 smaller, the smaller project, the smaller projects. And, uh, and Hopkins was expanding, Johns Hopkins. And uh, they had purchased a lot of the uh, the land around Dunbar, and uh, they began tearing the buildings down. So we didn't have the fancy equipment. So it came to my mind, why can't we use these bricks that are lying that's lying across the street? So I had my little managers to, to take the laundry cart. We went outside, went up the street, and we loaded the uh, the laundry basket up with the uh, bricks. Mm -hmm. and we came back and we had some old baseball jerseys uh uniforms the, you know the ones they wore like in the 40s and 50s <laughs> flannel and we cut them up wrapped the bricks up and taped them and uh that that was that was our uh conditioning we used the bricks for for conditioning and it really helped a lot in my opinion because in the fourth quarter in a ball game other teams are breathing heavy. My kids were, they were strong. They were ready to go. Did you, uh, did you introduce that to Bernie Fine at Syracuse? Because he brought out some bricks like my sophomore, junior year. I was like, where the hell did these come from? Yeah, with Bernie, yeah we were at Five Star together. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> and, and Brendan Malone and all, yeah. We were all at Five Star together. Uh, yeah. So I should have been cursing at you. I was cursing at Bernie. <laughs> And then I looked up one, 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 uh, what, a couple years ago. Uh, what was the kid? The kid from uh, he was a former coach at Marquette uh, from Baltimore. Uh, Wojciechowski. Wojciechowski oh, Woj, yeah. Was, was yeah. using the bricks. Yeah, he was using the bricks. And, yeah. That's crazy. So okay, so now you you've got you've got your crew, and this team is a very deep team mugs talk about some of the guys that came off the bench uh for you guys that w wound up playing d1 basketball herm harid is one he's a good buddy of ours and uh sonny's in particular syracuse guy talk about that for a second coach you want to take that one yeah well herman Herman was from uh, the Cecil Kirk uh, Recreation Center. That's where he played ball uh, under the leadership of Anthony Lewis. But uh, he came in and uh, he uh, he he played well. His uh, his, uh, his his sophomore and junior year, he played well. But he was behind. You know, he played behind uh, Reggie and Reggie Williams, uh, Tim Dawson. He played behind him. But when he got his opportunity after those kids left, uh, Reggie w went on to Georgetown, mugged to the Wake Forest. It became Herman's team. Herman was a captain. And uh, I remember his junior, end of his junior year, we went to five star. I, take, I would take the kids to five star. He had an excellent five star. He, he was, uh, got won the uh, MVP of the camp. His team won the championship. Uh, he got a lot of notoriety, and uh, I thought he was going to go to Virginia. Uh, he really liked Virginia, but he chose to uh, sign with Syracuse. But he was an excellent, he's an ex outstanding player, 
outstanding individual, more importantly. And uh, and currently today, he's doing a fantastic job as a head coach at Lake Clifton High School, yep. where he's won several state championships uh, and sets a great example for his kids. Yeah. Walks the walk, talks the talk. Yep. But you you guys you guys went real deep though on the bench. You had you had D one kids and one in particular. I mean, Re Reggie Lewis doesn't start on this team, coach. No, he didn't. Uh, Timmy Dawson was our enforcer inside. Okay, Timmy was about what six 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 seven. He could really he could really jump. Uh, so we we inserted Timmy as. A, as a starter, but Reggie would come off the bench and do a fantastic job. To give an example, we were up in Johnstown, the Johnstown tournament, and uh, I think Reggie Williams fouled out, uh, Mike Brown, a lot of the key kids fouled out. And uh, uh, Ray Lewis comes to the ball game, and uh, we, won, we won the tournament, we won the game and the tournament, and Reggie's He's named the MVP of the tournament, Reggie Lewis. So uh, whenever he got an opportunity, he, he would come in and spark us, give us another another uh, a, a lethal weapon. Because yeah. in my opinion, he was a he was a better scorer than Tim Dawson. But Tim Dawson was a was a tremendous leaper and forcer around the basket. Yeah. Then this the second. Uh team the 82 um 83 team you guys started going around and playing people all over the place at that point right because at, at that point everybody knew you were good and now you had to play uh the, the best of the best so to speak so Muggsy I have a question for you there's a there's a play I guess everybody had talked about this play uh and the, the the Matha game where you had some kind of 360 degree Alley you pass to Reggie Williams and Reggie put the ball and put it in and uh talk about that for a second if you will because everybody from what I hear from talking to people everybody was more impressed with the pass than than the dunk and on an alley oop everybody's usually impressed with the dunk you I know? see so coach smile about that for a second I see coach smile yeah <laughs> Uh, well, it was you know just a, a, a distinctive play. Uh, he was I was in the air. I, I was going up for a layup. They they was able to cut me off. Uh, two guys and I saw Reg out the corner of my eye and I just you know flicked it over my neck and he was able to catch it, and finish it. So that's what, that that was the highlight of that of that play. Uh, but we just always connected instead of uh, a feel for one another. We've been playing. With each other ever since we were seven, eight years old. So that was nothing new. Did you know that was coming, Reg, or was that a little bit of a surprise when you caught that one? Um, it wasn't a surprise. But we we have um, you know, if I was if I ran the court, I knew Mugsy would find me. Yeah. You know, so um, if we had a chance to um get fast break rebound and get out on on a uh, court, uh, Mugsy Mugsy would find us. I'm sorry so, about that. So that's okay. So Reg, so you're you're now the the number one player in the in the country in high school, getting recruited by everybody, right? Yeah. How did how did you guys how was that handled? Uh, your recruitment process, along with you had uh, eleven other guys getting recruited. Who took care of all that stuff for you guys? Was it coach, or did you have somebody else handling that stuff? No, coach did all the um the recruitment things. He, it, well, everything went through him, you know, while we um played basketball. So he handled everything, talking to the coaches, um, if they was gonna visit or if we were gonna visit the school, he took care of all that. So how did you manage that coach with all of those kids that were that were getting recruited by everybody? I just we had a schedule. You know, the coaches would if they want to come in and uh, like a home visit or whatever, we would sit. I'd set it up, uh, talk to the parent, and uh, we'd set it up. And I would, I would do my best to, to be there, to be there doing, uh, doing those visits. Uh, but I had a thing. Uh, coaches could not call the kids after nine o'clock. Some of them would. 
they try to sneak it in. Right. And I, I would lay the law down if you call after, you know, after I tell you not to and would just strike you off the list. <clears throat> so, Coach, you you established the culture, right? And and this is how it's going to be. And right. obviously the, the, the respect that you have from your players is – is you know you can feel it and sense it. So I'm going to ask Reggie and Muggsy, either of you, answer the question: Were there times where you had that? I need to do this. Coach needs to let me go. Was there any conflicts that you guys remember that you wanted to do, but Coach was that they were doing it this way? You want to go first, Muggs? At the point guard of the of the team, I had pretty much a feel of what's all. Uh, need to be done there in terms of distributing the basketball, who, what, and where they needed to get the basketball. Uh, at certain times, the situation, you know, Coach Trust had in, in, in my hands in that regard. So we, we pretty much – How about you, Red? Well, we um we had um pretty much an open offense. Uh, Coach didn't um, have plays where, you know, you designated players – you had to post this player or post that player. It was pretty open. I mean, um, we played good defense. We rebound. We ran the floor. Um, if um, we didn't um, score early, um, we would move the ball. A lot of teams played us um, zone um, because they were afraid of, you know, the man-to-man -man matchup. But um, we had to deal with a lot of zones, you know, a lot of times. But um, it wasn't, you know, you know, he had a lot of good players, but he didn't, you know, designate guys. You know, he had to get the ball um, or he had to score this amount of points. Um, Muggsy took care of most of that on the court. You know, he took directions from coach, and he he ran he ran what he he saw on the court. If you was open, you would get the ball. Now, so, in in your in your experiences playing against who you played against, what are some of the like we talked about the Camden game? Was there any other memorable either matchups or opponents that you came on that you were? You know, it was just a special moment that you remember. Muggsy, you got any you remember? Uh, not really. Uh, uh, we pretty much beat every team pretty much by double figures. And <laughs> only two teams we didn't beat by double figures. So it was a uh, – I mean, it, was a, it wasn't many, much to really remember our opponents. We always had a mission go in. Uh, and destroy and come out with the win. How about you, Rich? Um, I could say, um, you know, we um, we struggled a little bit in Johnstown, but we still won the ball game. You know, I fouled out Mike Brown. I think he was in trouble. Reggie came in, um, and then um, I think um, oh, yeah. in York we were in Harlem against um, uh, a team. Um, there uh, that we had to we had to play. Um, you know, it was some home cooking. People in the um, stands wanting to shoot the players after the game, and you know, don't hit the free throw or you or else. So we had to deal with a lot of stuff like that. But we were, you know, we was mentally, you know, tough. You know, so we were from the neighborhood also. But um, they were probably the two games that um, we didn't um, beat. Um, a team by double figures or whatever, but hey, it was a road game and um, we persevered. Coach, any matchups you remember, like guys that, that you know stood out that you either had to do something against or just just you know guys that had that special high school persona that you know were going to be great players later. Was that my question? Yeah. Was that me? Okay. Yeah. I think, let me go back. I think what, what Reggie was, the, the game Reggie was talking about, it kind of broke up a little bit, Reg. We were in, we were in New York and uh, we were playing, uh, oh, I can't think his name. Anyway, the, the um, David Wenger, David Wenger got fouled. His name was Sky. Uh, what's his name, Muggs? Anyway, David Wingate got uh, fouled. And Scott he, something? Yeah. Scott Irvin. Scott Irvin. Yeah. Uh, like the sky, Scott Irvin. Andre Scott Irvin. Andre Scott Scott Irvin. Irvin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Scott. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, and he had to go to the foul line 
and had to make two crucial, crucial free throws. And uh, a spectator stood up and, and behind a basket and, and, and pulled a gun out and, and, and said, if you make the shot, I'm going to shoot you. So I called time out. The team came to the bench. And I, I asked David, David, what's wrong? He said, I swear to God, said he was going to shoot me if I make the free throw. I said, don't you worry about that. You make the free throw, because if you don't make the free throw, I'm going to kick you behind. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, now, that's playing so in a tough out. neighborhood right there. Coach. Yeah. That's oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we made the free throws. We won the game. Yeah. But um, I think another local, on a local level, we had a, we would always play uh, a local team, Lake Clifton High School. And uh, we'd have some some real Donnie Brooks with them. Uh, then Melvin Mathis, who went on to uh, Drake University, had a fantastic career there. Melvin uh, was was Al Al Al, Al Menis, Nemes rather. He would give us problems, but Reggie and Muggs later on the game they would solve that problem. So, but just on a local level, Melvin I I, I think uh, gave us some problems. Muggs, okay. talk about playing with a chip on your shoulder. You know, I, I mean, everybody, when they first look at you, they, they everybody says, wow. And next thing you know, you're making steals, you're making assists. You could dominate a game without scoring a point the way you played the game. I mean, I've always loved the way you've played with such heart and such, you know, hustle. You know, your whole game is all hustle and speed. So talk about what that's like. You know, you 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 got to have a chip on your shoulder when you when you come into a lot of guys do, but I would imagine that you would have a big chip on your shoulder when you're coming into a game like that and listening to all the boo birds and stuff. I didn't have, I didn't have a chip on my shoulder, but you know, I was more secure to who I was and what I brought to the. It was just the yeah. opponent said that inquisitive mind. Because um, you know, I, I groomed as a young kid with the confidence, so it wasn't a matter of uh, me having a chip. It was always that I always knew I was really out of you or, you know, I mean, you just going to have a uh, time guarding me because it's, you've never seen a guy like me. So that was my, you know, my teammates wanting to win. We always, as kids, we hate losing. Hate losing. Um, no matter if it was a pickup game or or I just hate losing. So as a youngster, you know, I, I, I can count on my hand how many, games, you know, throughout my uh, uh, days of a uh, career. Um, I, the dudes that didn't come until I got into college and NBA, that sort of stuff. But all the way up and then, you know, we always won and that was something that always hung my hand on. Yeah, I, you know, and I'm, as I watched you progress, now you, you wind up you know, you wind up playing in the NBA for 15 years, you know, uh, a, a stellar career. You know, you've been through the, all the wars and stuff. You had to, uh, you, you had to take some of what you learned from coach and where, and where you were at, uh, at Dunbar to, uh, you know, to, to the league with you. What was some of the things that, you know, that you took from coach and applied them into your NBA career? Well, you know, coach instilled a lot in us, you know, him, Mr. Howard, you know, just the tenacity, never give up, you know, believing in yourself, uh, always outwork your opponent, you know, the discipline that we had within uh, the self-esteem, the self-confidence um, that I had with myself, I always carried that wherever I went. Um, it was never a doubt uh, within myself, my skill set and my talent because I was taught by the best and I was, you know, mentored by the best. Uh, you know, having that mindset, understanding who you were, not allowing anyone to influence you or give you any way means of not believing in yourself, you know, with me. It came in one hand, the other. So those are always took with me. Reg, you you come out, you're you're the number one uh player in the country at that time. You decide to go to Georgetown. We've 
we've talked about that, okay? You and I and on the show. Talk about that time when you left for a couple of weeks and how coach had to talk you back into going back to school at Georgetown. Um, you know, uh, Coach Thompson have a, a, a way of uh, getting on your nerves. <laughs> yeah, well, some, yeah, a lot of coaches. Reg, you you come out. You're you're the number one uh, player in the country at that time. You decide to go to Georgetown. We've we've talked about that, okay? You and I, and on the show. Talk about that time when you left for a couple of weeks, and how coach had to talk you back into going back to school at Georgetown. Um, you know, uh, Coach Thompson have a a, a way of uh, getting on your nerves. <laughs> yeah, well, some yeah, a lot of coaches do. Yep, I get it. So uh, you know, I, I was used to discipline because I I had it pretty much all my life. You know, especially at uh, Dunbar. You know, uh, coach wasn't a yeller. He yes, he would yes get you to do the things that you need to do as far as the bricks or running sprints or you know working hard. He didn't. He wasn't a you know a cursor, but Thompson was, and yeah. so I didn't like that. Um, but I could deal with anything else. So I just got tired of it. You know, I said, I don't have to, you know, listen to this mess. I can go right. somewhere. So, um, but, um, you know, I returned back talking to coach and um, some other mentors that, um, you know, I had at the time. But, uh, you know, I'm glad I did go back and um, and then, you know, face the music and and, and have a great career. So, coach, what, what words of wisdom did you give uh, young Reggie at the time when he left as a freshman? You know, you have you had a huge influence on his life, still do. I know Reggie talks about you with great reverence. And uh tell us what, you know, what kind of what was what went on in that conversation to talk to guy to going back to the to the hilltop. Well, I just told him to uh you know think think about it. Uh I thought he was in a in a great situation. He just had to get to get used to uh Coach Thompson's way of coaching. Uh, yeah, you know he. John was always a yeller, and uh, uh, and Reggie, Reggie, Reggie can be he he can be he's kind of sensitive, you know. You got to handle him a little a little different, and I, I told John that, and um, you know we we talked about it and. And, uh, and Reggie went back, but I, I just told him I just thought he was making a big mistake to uh, to stick it out, and um, and hopefully things would would work out, which it did. Yeah, it certainly did. You know, he had a, a, a outstanding career there. So here's one person we haven't really discussed, Reg. Yep. You, you first talk about talk about Reggie Lewis and uh, what kind of guy he was, and that whole situation was just uh, unbelievable for those of us that really didn't know uh Reggie like you guys do the, the, I remember when that happened and everybody was in complete shock because nobody realized that he had a situation a health situation talk about what kind of guy he was Reg and and uh and what your memories are of him um he was pretty much um identical to me you know quiet laid back um you know didn't say much um he did his talking on the court you know his game did his talking and um, he uh, he played his role, you know. He didn't, um, you know. He came off the bench, and when it was time to play, he played. Um, he didn't um, bitch about anything. Uh, you're not starting. He may he may made a um may have wanted to start, but um, but the situation didn't present itself at that time. But uh, you know, he was a you know a humble guy. Um, you know, really really good player. Had a very good first step that could get his little jump off his 15 foot jump shot off. Uh, you know, he had all the tools, you know, in his bag. Um, and yeah. it was, uh, it was a, you know, um, a sad situation. You know, we didn't know at the time that he had those health problems. I don't know if Mr. Wade knew him or not early on, but you know, when it happened, you know, they were playing against Muggsy in the playoff game, Boston. Right. Charlotte. Um, and, uh, you know, I was watching the game because, you know, I had friends on the team, Muggsy, David. Yeah. David, yep. Yeah. And when he fell, when he, um, you know, fell down, we didn't, I didn't know what, you know, what, nobody hit him. He, nobody was around him. 
and you know we we were all concerned about it and um you know it's just a sad situation how about you coach what are your recollections of reggie lewis well first of all i did not know reggie had a uh, had a heart problem you know uh, the kids had to take a physical yeah. before they participated in uh in uh in the interscholastic athletic program uh and he he passed uh his mom never said anything to me about him having a, a problem uh but i mean had i known the drills that we were doing he would have never he would have never had to uh, participate in them i mean running yeah. the running running with those bricks and then going up and down the uh the, the stairwell they would run from the gymnasium up to the third floor and then come back down. And Reggie and Muggsy didn't mention they also had to run with sandbags uh, <laughs> on their backs. So mm -hmm. had I known that, he, he wouldn't have done that. But uh, he was a very he was a very quiet individual. Reggie Lewis was. Um, he was very attentive. Uh, he uh, he would be one of the first guys up on the floor. He'd get the toss back out. And uh, and work work on his uh, his step like Reggie alluded to Reggie Williams just alluded to had a very good first step nice crossover uh, and he would work on his jump shot work on his little baby hook so uh, he was very motivated and uh, and Reggie Reggie Williams uh, brought out the best of him because he had to play Reggie in practice and uh, he was just a great kid. Just a great kid, um, and had a had a had a birth of a fantastic career. He was just starting, just starting to blossom when he when he fell to a, to his ailment. Yeah, and, and, and you know what, an ultimate team player too, because he didn't he didn't bitch and complain about his role with you guys, and then goes to Northeast and it scores twenty seven hundred yeah. points. Who knew, right? What was going to happen? Um, the, I, the I, one I thing. Ask yeah. a question. Go ahead. You guys, because you mentioned it, Reg. You mentioned about watching the guys. So now you got a, you got four guys in the league, and then more from your college. When you got an opportunity to play against Muggsy or David or Reggie, what was it like in the league when you got to play on on the big court with those guys or against those guys? What was that experience like, Reg? I think the um, only one we. Go ahead, Coach. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, uh, as far as Reggie Williams was concerned, we we didn't play uh, on a collegiate level. I didn't. We never played a game against them, but we practiced against Georgetown, uh, a close practice, my first year. Uh, and as far as Muggsy's concerned, we did play against Muggsy, uh, and I told my point guard, I said. You can't you can't dribble the ball uh, like you're doing around Muggsy. He's going to take it from you, and uh, and he said, "Oh, he's not going to take it from me." He's you know. <laughs> so I said, "I'm telling you, he's going to take the ball from you." And uh, and if you pass him, if you go dribble past him, get the put the ball in front. Don't put it. Keep it to the side. He said, "I, I I'm, I'm not worried about that." And Muggsy stole the ball at least three or four times from him. And um, so that's the only time that we played against Muggsy. We lost to uh, to Wake Forest. Yeah, that's what uh, coach Muggsy was, had a uh, fantastic game. Coach, you didn't tell him where you were were coaching. You were the um, head coach at Maryland. That's how you played right. against. Yep. Oh yeah. Oh, that's what I was alluding to. Yeah, I didn't say Maryland. Yeah. Yeah. But when we coached, when I coached at Maryland, yeah, we played uh, we played Muggsy one time at Wake Forest. At Wake, yeah. How about you, Reg? Like when when you're in the pros and you're playing against Muggsy, what's what's that uh, like? I, I didn't like playing against my play my my homeboys. You know what I mean? So I, you know, <laughs> it was uh, it was uncomfortable. You know, uh, because we're gonna go out to dinner after the game, so it wasn't no bragging rights or anything like that against David, against Reggie, Mug. You know, so but anybody else, you know, we were going at him. I was going at him, but those guys, you know. Um, we gonna we gonna be friends, you know, to the end. So it, you know, it ain't make me no difference. So, it... <laughs> how about you, Bucks? What were those games like? 
What? Yeah, that, and Reggie, he hit it on the nose. Uh, you know, once we played against each other, I mean, because, you know, we all had different play, different position. You know, I mean, for me, I'm always roaming around trying to make sure I help my teammates out and trying to, you know, give them help as much as possible can. But, you know, when we play against, you know, because they did not play with us. We was on the same team. He played with us. Uh, we went and got him from San Antonio. So he was fortunate enough to play with us at Charlotte. Um, but when we had out to the, both of the Reggies, I mean, we enjoyed it. was very true enjoyment and seeing each other on the floor. We all felt like, you know, we always our dreams and, and being able to be on the court at the same time with one another was a blessing. And then yeah. in 10 I played, Muggsy never um, took the ball from me. He probably could have, but he never <laughs> stole the ball. <laughs> you let him go, Muggs. <laughs> let him go. Yeah, I want to try. I tell you, we want to try. I, you know, I, I, I wasn't in help position. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wasn't in position at that time. So, okay, so let's let's – Let's start to wrap this up a little bit. We're getting a little bit late. I know it's, I appreciate you guys staying with us so long. Okay. You know, in, in the documentary, what struck me more than anything else is, you know, Muggs, I think you said everybody stayed out of trouble. Everybody graduated, which is the most important thing, you know, and everybody went D1, basically. I think that was the quote. How, Coach, were you able to accomplish that in the environment that you guys were played in and where you lived and everything? And you had you had numerous guys. Now, I don't know about the other guys. I know about the four guys that went to the league. Everybody came out as seemingly unscathed by that experience. How, how does that happen? And what a, what a tribute to you, your character, and how you help these young men become, you know, adults. Well, the, the, the groundwork was had, had been laid. They, everybody, uh, they knew. They knew I, I demanded, I demanded respect, and I've demanded excellence from them, not just as basketball players, but as student athletes. Um, I would go around to various classes, checking on them, to make sure they were, you know, in the class, sitting in the front of the class, not in the back of the class. Um, but they all wanted to, they all wanted to succeed, uh, because the groundwork had been laid, uh, you know, by, by former players, you know, Skip Wise, Larry Gibson, yeah. and, uh, and they wanted to uh, succeed like, like those kids did. So in order to do that, they had to, to do their best academically, uh, and, and play hard, you know, when the opportunity came. Uh, to get on the court and uh, and just be good citizens. And that's what coaches were looking for. They didn't, they weren't looking for guys to come into their program to give, you know, give them headaches because their job would be on the line. So, um, but I just think that the groundwork had been laid. They wanted to excel. Uh, and they, uh, they just, they worked hard and they followed the rules and they became out. They, they, they came out, uh, Victorious, they got scholarships. Yeah, I, I, you know, and and that's not how it is in a lot of places, though, Coach. That's that was what I was trying to get at. I mean, that's not the norm. You know, a lot of the guys, the old school coaches. I was fortunate enough to play for a guy like that, where the relationship with your coach went well beyond the basketball court. It went to the home. It went to the street. It went to the classroom. It was it was more than just. You know, your job is to be a coach first, okay? But there's much more to that because now you've actually become right. a life coach and teacher for these guys. And I I just, when I, I didn't realize, you know, and Reggie and I, you know, have rekindled our friendship over the last three or four years. And I didn't realize where the, those guys came from and where that school was and what was going on in the background there and how that can be very distracting to put it mildly uh you know to to playing in a basketball game and going to school and doing the things that you would do as a student athlete you know and uh, i just take my hat off to you man i think you did a great right. job 
with those guys. And I think, you know, um, when you hear, when you talk to a guy like Reggie and we talk to a guy like Herm, we, we know, we know both those guys pretty well. Everybody says uh, great things and credits you for uh, where they are in their life today. So that must, that must mean a lot to you. Thank you. What do you think? It really Reggie? does. It really does. Well, um, you know, Mr. Wade, um, He's from East Baltimore, so he knows a right. lot of people. So um, Muggsy and I, we knew to stay out of trouble because he had all the spies around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so everybody everybody report back to him. So he it wasn't nothing that went on in those projects that, that uh, Coach Wade didn't know about. So, and yeah, I'm plus, sure of that. And plus, uh, you know, we had good mentors. Um, even the guys who were street guys knew that we, um, you know, we were, we were ballers. They didn't mess with us. They wanted. Right. They came to the game to watch us play, you know. So, man, Mr. Wade knew knew all those guys because they went to school at Dunbar. So we didn't right. have no problem. We we wasn't. You know, a lot of things was going on around us, but uh, we kind of you know tunneled those things out because we um we wanted to play basketball. We wanted to get to college, and um, you know pros wasn't on our mind. We just wanted to get to college because we you know we love Maryland. You know mugs. We um used to watch Maryland, Ernie Graham right. and all the teams, the Albert King teams, and um we loved to watch yeah. Maryland. We wanted to, you know, uh, to get to where they were. So basketball was the shelter from the storm, really. Yeah. 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 What about you, Muggs? I mean, talk about you know your relationship with Coach Wade and and what he means to you. Oh, Coach, Coach Matt, as we say, he was like a father figure. Uh, we all, most of us, didn't have that that mentor in our house. You know, I, my father got in prison when I was 12. Um, so, you know, being able to have someone that understood you, that had your best interests, uh, always told you what you needed to focus on as opposed to what you wanted to hear, I mean, meant the world to us. Because, you know, we had... We, we like I said, we didn't have vision at the time, but we had an understanding that we wanted uh, to change our lives. Basketball gave us the uh, avenue in order to do so. It, it gave us a means to stay focused and keep our mind on what we wanted, to, which was to go to school and play the game of basketball. And being able to have, uh, like we had a, our village pretty much took care of us. You know, the guys who were street guys wanted to make sure that. We stayed away from the, the negative part of it. And then we had people that was in the household giving us the inspiration to continue to stay on the right path. So, and then, you know, Mr. Wade just captured it all where he was able to manage it all and, and stay in contact with all of our loved ones to make sure that we all had that extension of it. That's great. And it's a, and it's a good story, Coach. It really is. And uh, what a way to end a great show. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for coming out. I really appreciate you hanging with us um, and uh, battling through some of the technical difficulties we had. Thank you so much for coming in. Reggie, thanks, my friend, for setting this up for us. We appreciate you, thanks, as Rich. always. Probably. And uh, you guys are welcome to come back anytime you like, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank guys. You guys. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. You've been right, listening guys. to watching appreciate the Big East Rewind with Chuck Everson and Sonny Sparrow. The Big East Rewind was produced and directed by Nick Chico Chorus and Daryl Gurney. Check us out on all things social media. I'm putting Big East Rewind in the search bar. You can see the show on YouTube. And our website is now live and up and running. You can go to www.bigeastrewind.com. Be sure to subscribe. And uh, we hope you enjoy it. Thanks for having have, being with us. And have a great night.